The Chase, a deadly contest between predator and prey. It can be as brief as a second or go on for hours. It all depends on who you are, where you live and what you're chasing. But all chases have one simple rule. Whoever wins stays alive. To survive, you must be built for the kill. The chase is a lethal game of tag in which predator and prey must try to outsmart and outrun each other. The difference between life and death can be a split second. Speed and agility, stealth and bravado. A hunter is a killing combination of body design and strategy. From a smash and grab eagle raid to the power of a wolf pack and fish finding missiles hunting at sea, each chase is a finely calculated search and destroy mission. And survival always depends on being built for the kill. Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Arctic. The top predator here is a wolf, a white wolf. Wolves live in packs, but food is hard to find here, and this wolf pack is small. Just mum, dad, and the kids. Wolves are one of the most widespread carnivores on the planet. They can survive in extreme environments like this because they're cunning and adaptable. The wolves might look like they're having fun, but survival here is a deadly game. And while a lemming is a tasty snack, something bigger would be better. White wolves are built for chasing down dinner. They're supreme runners that can sprint up to 50 kilometers or 30 miles an hour. But they can also lope for hours, traveling up to 160 kilometers or 100 miles in a single day. It all depends on what's on the menu. In summer, a feature dish here is Arctic hare. There's only one problem. With its oversized back legs and feet and its long stride, an adult hare can run faster than a wolf. For only a few weeks each year, the wolves have a chance. Young hares or leverets aren't quite so quick. To find a target, the wolf uses an arsenal of sensory weapons. Its long muzzle gives it an incredibly acute sense of smell. it can pick up a scent trail from almost two and a half kilometers, well over a mile away. A wolf has finely tuned hearing and can detect sounds at a much higher frequency than humans. It also has good binocular vision. Even though it sees the world virtually in black and white, that's bad news for the white Arctic hare. The hare uses all its speed and agility to try and outrun and outsmart its pursuer. The soles of its hind feet are hairy for extra grip. But the wolf can go one better. Just watch it turn as the hare jinks and swerves in a desperate bid to escape. The wolf's claws act as cleats, good for cornering. When it comes to chasing young hares, a lone wolf relies on speed, skill and an element of luck.
central Canada. And another wolf pack uses a different strategy to take on the biggest animal in the Americas. There's little chance a wolf hunting on its own could bring down one of these monsters. American buffalo, or bison, are some 150 times the size of a hare. They're a formidable prey that stands nearly two meters, that's six feet at the shoulder. A male can weigh over a ton. They have sharp horns and can be dangerous. In a head-on confrontation, a buffalo would be capable of injuring or even killing a single wolf. So instead, the wolves work in a group. The pack has two leaders, the alpha male and alpha female. The dominant animals have raised ears and tails. Subordinate animals lick at mouths like pups begging for food. Every animal knows its place. Wolves howl to tell other packs to stay away from their territory. A wolf chorus can be heard up to 10 kilometers or six miles away. The size of the territory depends on the number of wolves in the pack. It can be as small as a suburb or bigger than New York City. On the vast plains of Canada, buffalo herds could number hundreds, even thousands of animals. There's strength in numbers. For the wolf, this is dinner on the hoof. Wolves and buffalo live side by side. The buffalo seem able to tell when a wolf is on the prowl or just passing by and know not to be alarmed. Although a herd that has been attacked before is more alert. The wily wolves won't often tackle a fully grown buffalo. They don't want to waste energy or risk getting injured. They prefer to target an animal that is sick or slower than the rest. A calf is easier to kill. The wolves stalk to get as close as possible. If the buffalo hold their ground, the wolves won't risk an attack. If one animal starts running, the whole herd will join in. The chase is on. For the wolves, it's a test to see if they can get close to their intended victim. But the buffalo are fast runners. At speeds of more than 60 kilometers or 35 miles an hour, they're faster than the wolves. If the wolves can't get close, they will soon give up. More than nine out of 10 hunts fail. If a quick kill isn't possible, they'll go for a test of endurance. They might run the buffaloes for more than five kilometers or three miles. It can take them several days to finally complete their kill. The wolves nip at heels and harry the herd from the back, trying to separate their prey. As soon as it starts to lag behind, they jump on it, slowing it down and trying to wound it. Separated from the herd, it's now vulnerable. The buffalo tries to keep facing its opponents. It desperately seeks safety in the river. But the wolves follow. Tired wolves grab a brief rest while their pack mates carry on. Eventually, the buffalo is just too exhausted to fight. The wolves have their victory. By working together, wolves can take down animals much bigger than themselves. On their own, or as part of a team, wolves are expert at the chase and built for the kill. Coming up next on Built for the Kill, a pocket-sized assassin hunts on its own in the night forest. Out in the open ocean, speed is the deadliest weapon. A Golden Eagle's search and destroy mission unfolds in the skies of the Himalayas. A pirate seabird grabs its chance. And living torpedoes on the chase for fish.
the Asian rainforest can be a dense, steamy jungle. Tall trees and thick vegetation create an obstacle course. In this dark and shadowy world, predators need different skills and strategies. There's no point trying to work in a group, so this pocket-sized assassin hunts on its own. Small, fast and deadly, it's probably not what you'd expect a killer to be. The Philippine Tarsia may seem wide-eyed and innocent, but don't let looks deceive you. This is the face of a killer. An adult Tarsia weighs only about 120 grams or 4 ounces. It's so small, it can sit in the palm of a hand. This primitive primate hunts in the dark using sight and sound. Each enormous eye is larger than its brain. If human eyes were as large in proportion to our skull, they would be the size of a grapefruit. The eyes are too big to swivel in their sockets, so the tarsia rotates its head round to the back like an owl. It's like having eyes in the back of its head. Perfect all-round vision. It's looking for large insects, such as a beetle or this forest mantis. Like any assassin, the Tarsia pinpoints its target with precision, lining it up for the killing pounce. The Tarsia missed. The mantis's prayers were answered, this time. The tarsia also relies on incredibly sensitive hearing to locate prey in the nocturnal jungle. These long fingers have pads on the tips for extra grip. It's poised for the kill. Once the tarsia locked on, it made a single deadly strike. The mantis was the victim of a perfectly executed ambush. One chase down, another five or six to go. This little hunter needs plenty of fuel to keep chasing through the night. It covers a lot of ground for a tiny animal. A male may travel more than one and a half kilometers, nearly a mile, in one night. What makes the Tarsia really built for the chase is its amazing skeleton. It has enormous leg muscles to power it into the air. The bottom third of its two lower leg bones are fused together. They act like shock absorbers when it lands. The spring-loaded tarsia can leap more than 25 times its own body length, up to 3 meters or nearly 10 feet. The tarsia locates a large beetle on the ground below. It looks, listens, and lines up its goal. It leaps, but too late. Another Tarsia got there first. Let's see that again. When it comes to the chase, the difference between winner and loser can be as little as a split second. Tarsias are solitary. They don't seek out company but two Tarsiers can sometimes find themselves chasing the same insect. They each have their own territories to hunt in, but a male's territory may overlap with the territories of two or three females. This Tarsier scent marks before continuing the hunt, and it's not long before it's found another beetle.
tropical rainforests are among the most diverse environments on Earth. The night forest is full of potential dinners. The secret to the Tarsia's success lies in preparation. The actual attack and kill is almost too fast to see. Here it is again in slow motion. In mid-leap, the Tarsia is a speeding missile, tucked into an aerodynamic ball. As it closes in, its long grasping fingers reach out, its eyes are closed, and its mouth, filled with needle-sharp teeth, is open to deliver the killing bite. In the jungle, looks can be deceiving. The most unlikely creatures can be baby-faced assassins. While Tarsiers strike from the shadows, gannets dive from the sky as they chase down fish. For a few months each year, these supreme seabirds come to clifftop vantage points to lay eggs and raise their chicks. They're never far from the sea, and they're always on the lookout for food. So is the striped marlin, the open ocean equivalent of a wolf hunting in grassland. It's a powerful killer that is fast and capable of a long chase. First though, it has to find some fish. The gannets are also looking from high in the sky. They're superb gliders with long wings to give them good lift. They soar effortlessly using updrafts off the waves as they scan the sea below for potential dinner. When they've located some fish, gannets can dive from 30 meters, nearly 100 feet above the water. They're adapted to survive the impact. The front of the skull is reinforced and strong. It's a built-in crash helmet. They have air sacs on their chest and neck to cushion the blow of entering the water. At the very last moment before impact, they take a deep breath and inflate them. Gannets had impact-absorbing airbags long before cars. When it comes to chasing fish, marlin and gannets are two of the fastest animals around. Their weapon is speed. The marlin has located a school of fish. It zeroes in, reaching speeds of 80 kilometers or 50 miles an hour. The speed comes from its tail. The crescent-shaped blade acts like a hydrofoil giving lift. Its superbly streamlined body cuts through the water with almost no drag. It hits its prey like a living torpedo, stunning them with its long bill. With no hope of outrunning the marlin, the fish pack into a tight ball. They might be trying to fool their attacker into thinking they're a single large fish, or perhaps they're just trying to confuse it. The marlin will find it hard to pick any one fish out from the swirling mass. The fish ball flees toward the surface, but there is more danger up there. They truly are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Tucking their wings in, the gannets dive at speeds of up to 145 kilometers, more than 80 miles per hour. Hitting water at this speed is like slamming into concrete, but the gannets' built-in airbags take the blow. Their beaks have sharp serrated edges to grip the fish. The gannet is a missile that strikes from the air, while the marlin is a living torpedo. 
two fish chasing specialists with different strategies for hunting in the open sea. From ocean depths to mountain peaks, every place has its predators. The dry Himalayan foothills are the perfect hunting ground for a golden eagle. A pair of eagles have nested here for many years. Each year's nest is built on top of the previous one. A female golden eagle is impressive, nearly a meter or more than three feet tall. She's a killing machine from top to toe, equipped with deadly weapons, razor-sharp eyesight, a powerful beak, and massive talons. It's breakfast time. The chicks are hungry. Time to go hunting. With wings that span more than two meters or six feet, a large tail, and huge flight muscles, the golden eagle is a fast, strong flyer that is perfectly built for the chase. It will take time and patience to find small animals such as marmots or hares. The eagle has a number of strategies for searching for prey. She can soar on thermals of air rising off the ground, conserving energy and scoping the ground from high above. Or she flies at low altitude, back and forth in every direction, quartering the ground in the hope of surprising a victim. As the sun finally reaches the bottom of the deep valleys, Himalayan marmots come out of their burrows. They're late risers and don't come above ground until the sun begins to warm things up. These big rodents are one of the eagle's favorite foods, and they know it. They're safe for now. The golden eagle has a huge territory and a lot of ground to cover. She's several valleys away from the marmot colony. With no threat in sight, it's time for a leisurely brunch as they fatten up for the next winter. But they take no chances there is always a sentry marmot on lookout duty for the whole colony. Their task, to remain vigilant and warn of approaching danger. Most marmots stay close to home. They're not fast runners, and at the first sign of danger, their survival strategy is to dash underground. But this young marmot has its eyes on greener pasture. The eagle is in search mode, scanning the ground. Her eyesight may be up to eight times more powerful than a human's. What would be a blur to us is in sharp focus for an eagle. That's because she has two centers of focus on each retina. One focuses out the front. The other concentrates focus more towards the sides. She can pinpoint her prey with deadly accuracy. The lookout marmot continues to scan for possible threats. An attack could come from a wolf on the ground or an eagle in the air. Secure in the knowledge that the lookout will sound the alarm, these young males are boxing. It's a ritual fight and no one's getting hurt, yet. The wandering youngster, meanwhile, is getting further away from the colony. And the mother eagle's hunting pattern has brought her to the Marmot's Valley. She's still searching for a possible victim, and she has killed here before. From high in the head of the valley, she sees the Marmots. She begins to close in. Her fast, silent approach should take her quarry by surprise although she succeeds in making a kill only 20% of the time. The lookout sees her coming. It shouts the alarm. The marmots head for cover. 
they all escape, except for the young marmot who has strayed too far and didn't hear the alarm call. And the eagle has seen it. The eagle is now flying low and fast. A stooping eagle can dive at speeds of up to 160 kilometers or 100 miles per hour. She bends her wings back to go faster and uses her tail to maneuver. Precision is vital. If she miscalculates at this speed, she could crash and injure herself. The marmot is fatally wounded on impact. The eagle's long talons each exert hundreds of kilos of pressure per square centimeter. What the claws begin, the eagle's sharp hooked beak finishes. The marmot never stood a chance against a bird that is built for the kill. The golden eagle is so strong, she can carry prey that weighs more than half what she does. Raised on a diet of meat, these small balls of fluff will grow up to be just like their mother, a ruthless killing machine that has mastered the art of the chase. Still to come on Built for the Kill. A flying fisherman with the brain of a mathematician. Tales of blood and murder with an old sea dog and a pirate gull. And from Antarctica to the equator, penguins are fish-seeking missiles. A flying fisherman with a mathematician's brain relishes the challenge of hunting in these rivers. The bald eagle makes a surprise attack to catch fish, but it doesn't fly around looking for dinner. This eagle picks a vantage point to spot fish swimming in the water below. It spied a target. The chase is on. It swoops in low and fast. Judgment is crucial, because the target is not where it appears to be. The bending of light through water creates an optical illusion. Although the fish appears to be here, it's actually here. The eagle must perform a split-second calculation to work out the exact location of its prey. The fish didn't even see the bald eagle coming. It's a perfect catch. When they first start hunting, young eagles usually miss, but after years of practice, they get it right nearly two-thirds of the time. The eagle's talons are strong, with rough foot pads, useful for gripping a slippery customer like a fish. For a few glorious weeks each autumn, bald eagles don't even have to chase down dinner. Salmon return to their spawning grounds and die in their thousands. For hungry eagles, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. Whether hunting on land or in the water, eagles are supreme flying machines with sharp eyes and sharper claws. They really are built for the kill. Seals share the bald eagle's taste for seafood, but they've taken the chase underwater into the fish's world. Their dog-like ancestors abandoned the land some 25 million years ago. Evolution has shaped these air-breathing mammals into streamlined torpedoes designed for the chase. Their legs have become short but strong. Their hands and finger bones are elongated and webbed for thrust and power. 
To keep the bullet-shaped head streamlined, eared seals have small ears that sit tight against the side of the head. They may be small, but they're one of the seal's most useful hunting tools. Underwater, a seal can tell exactly which direction a sound is coming from. Some seals may eat up to a quarter of their own body weight in fish and squid each day. Time to go fishing. Clumsy on land, the seal transforms into an athletic ballerina in the water. Lithe and muscular, the seal is perfectly adapted for the underwater chase. It gets power from its front flippers, while its hind flippers act as rudders to steer and turn. This awesome diver's chest and lungs compress to withstand pressure at depth. A seal can dive to 240 meters, nearly 800 feet, and then speed back up to the surface to breathe without getting the bends. This seal's hunting ground is a deep, dark fjord. To locate prey in the gloomy water, it relies on acute hearing and good eyesight. Its eyes sit high on its face, looking forward. Underwater, the pupils are open wide and the eyes bulge almost out of its head. It's located a school of fish, and it has a cunning technique to trap them. The sides of the fjord are steep, it begins to chase the fish up towards the surface and against the rock wall, where they will have no escape. With the seal in pursuit, the fish mass together for safety. However, the panicking fish create water currents that the seal can detect with its sensitive whiskers. It keeps herding them towards the surface. The plan works well. The seal has broken up the protective formation of the school. Fish leap out of the water and even onto the rocks in a desperate effort to escape. The seal's teeth are good for holding on to fish, but not for chewing. These fish are small enough to swallow whole. And there's even enough for a watching gull. At the end of a successful chase, the seal has a full stomach, and some of the fish have escaped to live another day. Antarctica a continent of stunning beauty and of the unexpected. Where birds fly out of the water only to come face to face with their worst predator. The skewer, a voracious seabird pirate. It survives here not because it's a specialist, but because it's a merciless opportunist that will chase and eat almost anything it can find. Pickings are slim in the frozen wastes of Antarctica, except in this crowded colony where Adelie penguins are incubating their eggs. The skewers aren't capable of killing an adult penguin. They're after the high-protein eggs, but the eggs are under 24-hour guard. To feed themselves and their tiny chicks, most skewers catch fish or krill at sea. But a few aggressive birds have specialized in taking penguin eggs and chicks. This is an uneven contest, where the predator is at a disadvantage. Adult penguins weigh nearly four times as much as an adult skewer. Their flippers are capable of breaking a skewer's wings, and maybe even killing it.
The skewers strafe the colony in a relentless low-level aerial bombardment, searching for any opportunity. This is not a job for the timid. Only the bravest birds take it on. To get an egg, they first have to get past the guard. Their strategy is to harass the penguins and distract them. There is too much danger from the closely packed penguins in the center of the colony, so their best chances will come around the edges. As long as the penguins hold their ground, their eggs will be okay. But they never know when they're about to be buzzed by a low-flying skewer. Tensions run high. Stressed and fighting amongst themselves, these penguins allow a precious egg to roll out of the nest. This is the moment the opportunistic skewer has been waiting for. It makes a lightning raid into the danger zone and escapes with the egg. Penguin eggs have stronger shells than most bird eggs, which increases the skewer's chances of getting the egg away from the danger of the nesting penguins. Skewers aren't custom-built predators. Although their feet have claws, they're still webbed for swimming. Their strong hooked beak is barely big enough to hold a penguin egg. Their best weapon is attitude, persistence and bravado. During the Antarctic summer, the sun never sets. The skewers hunt whenever they're hungry, 24 hours a day. After a five-week incubation, the penguin chicks are hatching. The small chicks will be safe as long as they are guarded by a parent. On their own, they're defenseless and could easily be overpowered and carried away by a skewer. The colony has almost doubled in size, but the skewers have only a few weeks to take advantage of this bonanza. The chicks grow fast. Soon they're too big to fit under an adult bird. Their parents struggle to catch enough fish and krill to feed them and must spend more time hunting at sea. Increasingly, chicks are left on their own. The skewers' tactics change. They begin to target the lone chicks. The chick's best defense is to hold its ground and face its opponent, to bluff its way out of danger. Instead of lightning fast air raids, the skewers launch sustained ground offensives. With not so many adult penguins around, the skewers are much bolder. If they stick together and keep facing their attacker, these chicks might be okay. They already weigh twice as much as the skewer and will be difficult to overpower. But their stalker has eyes that are bigger than its beak. It keeps probing for weakness for any vulnerable point. One of the chicks makes a run for it, a bad move. Luckily, the penguin cavalry arrives just in time. But there is no honor among thieves. Skewers will turn on each other in the blink of an eye. In this extreme environment, every scrap of food is worth fighting for. By late summer, the biggest chicks are fledging and are nearly ready to go to sea. But there are still some late hatching small chicks that could fall prey to the pirate gulls. It's not a quick kill. Skewers don't have an eagle's talons or a wolf's teeth. And this time, 
there are no adult penguins to come to the rescue. Despite the best efforts of its parents, this skewer chick is unlikely to make it to adulthood. Only a tenth of all skewer eggs hatch and survive, and in some years, none will make it through. But nearly two-thirds of the penguin chicks will leave the colony and swim out to sea for the winter. The penguins keep their advantage right to the end. But only out at sea will they be safe from the attack of the skewers. Next on Built for the Kill, penguins have their day. The chase is really on when the hunted become the hunters. In the high stakes world of the chase, prey can quickly become predator. Comical and vulnerable on land, in the water, penguins transform into swift, deadly hunters. Emperor penguins are supremely adapted for life both above and below water, in the coldest continent on Earth. Their feathers are a survival suit. While they're on land, special muscles erect the short, stiff feathers, which lock together and trap a layer of air against the skin, the penguin equivalent of double glazing. But the feathers must serve a dual role. Penguins may not soar into the air anymore, but underwater, they surely fly. Once in the water, their feathers are redeployed flat against the body for maximum streamlining and complete waterproofing. The insulating layer of air is forced out by changing pressure, leaving a vapor trail of bubbles. Feathers aren't the only things about penguins that have changed since they gave up flying. Their wings have become stiff paddles that propel them underwater. Their feet and tail act as rudders, helping them to turn. Emperor penguins chase down dinner in the ocean depths. They can even hunt on the sea floor more than 500 meters or 1600 feet down. They can hold their breath for up to 12 minutes at a time. They have less drag than the best designed boat or submarine and can swim faster than an Olympic gold medalist. The same body shape and swimming skills apply to penguins all the way from the largest, the emperor, to the smallest, the little penguin. This little penguin's hunting ground is shallow coastal water, an obstacle course full of weeds. Small fish have lots of places to hide. But their opponent homes in on its prey with deadly speed and accuracy. It's fast and maneuverable with lightning reflexes. This fish gets away, but the next one might not be so lucky. The fish senses the penguin coming and tries to dodge out of the way. But the penguin's strike is too fast. Dinner is swallowed whole. Some penguins actually live in the tropics. The Galapagos Islands are right on the equator, but the seas around them are very cold and rich in food. This penguin still has all the design features of its cousins in Antarctica. It's an underwater flying machine that is built for the chase. The water here is very clear. The only place for a fish to hide is in a crowd. The fish have congregated into a huge school. Like any school, it operates under a few simple rules. 
swim in the same direction as everyone else, and stay the same distance from your neighbor at all times. However, when a hungry penguin comes into the picture, another rule applies. Every fish for itself. All of the confusion will make it difficult for the penguin to lock onto a target. Out of the chaos, the penguin has managed to catch dinner. Penguins really are feathered fish-finding missiles. The chase is an age-old competition between predator and prey. Body design and tactics may change, but the goal is always the same. Outrun outwit, outlive. To survive, you must be built for the kill. <laughs> <laughs>